What's up, y'all? Welcome to the Dungeon Master Experience. In this video, we're diving into the fantastic Dungeon Master Experience articles by Chris Perkins. He's one of the lead designers of Dungeons and Dragons. We'll explore his invaluable insights and advice to enhance your skills as a Dungeon Master and create unforgettable D&D experiences for your players. What's up, y'all? This next article is called Big Map Attack, and it's from May 5th, 2011. Now, one of the things I've noticed while I'm making these videos is that some of these articles really have a lot of lore up front, and that really kind of gets into eyes glaze over territory. But luckily, this one doesn't have that much. But I actually kind of like the lore. But anyway, let's see what this article is all about. I'm excited about it. I think maps are super cool. I hope you all stick around with me, and I hope we all learn something. So let's check it out. Wednesday night. The Emperor of the Dragovar Empire is missing. The heroes chase a lead to a small island dominated by an extinct volcano and populated by hill giants. The giants pay homage to the island's gold dragon overlord, Zarendroth, even though the dragon has turned to stone many years ago. The huge petrified dragon stands proudly atop a rocky outcropping south of the hill giant village, and every morning, the giants leave a cornucopia of fresh food offerings at its feet. With Zarendroth indisposed, a black dragon named Kostralanth has moved into seaside caves set into the northern cliffs of the volcano but she's not yet powerful enough to impose her will upon the hill giants and assert herself as the island's new dragon overlord. So there we go. A giant petrified gold dragon. This sounds amazing. So it's a small island with a giant volcano in the middle, and somewhere on there, there's a huge petrified gold dragon, and there's giants running around. I think it's great. Let's keep going. There's more to the island than meets the eye, as my players will soon discover. In order to find out what's happened to the Emperor, the heroes will undoubtedly confront the Hill Giants, investigate the petrified remains of the Dragon Overlord, explore the hilltop cairns of the Giant's Cemetery, and perhaps even negotiate Kostralant's caves to reach the volcano's caldera. With so many possibilities, I felt it was important to provide my players with a map, and how I build maps is the subject of this article. I'm going to be real with you, I'm pretty excited to see how he builds maps. Oh, wow. He's getting technical with this. He's got Photoshop screenshots on here. Yeah, if you're just listening on this page, he has four screenshots of old school Photoshop. This is going to be legit. All right, let's go. All right. He says, my maps are not photorealistic. They're inspired by the works of David Diesel LaForce, a cartographer from TSR who did a lot of the early cartography for Dungeon Magazine, not to mention several old TSR adventures. My maps tend to be very clean and utilitarian, but they also have an organic hand-drawn quality that map making software has trouble emulating. Sometimes I'll draw maps the old fashioned way, freehand on graph paper. On this particular occasion, I'm using Adobe Photoshop CS4 and giving you an over the shoulder glimpse into my map making process. This is not intended as a Photoshop tutorial and I should warn you, I'm not a Photoshop whiz. However, you'd be amazed what you can do in Photoshop with just four tools, the pencil, the eraser, the paint bucket, and the type tool. All right, so this part of the article, it looks like a step-by-step. -step. There's a step one, step two, step three, etc., and it keeps on going. Each step has one screenshot, and I'll try to describe what it is, just in case you're just listening to this during work or something. Step one, say hello to Photoshop. I open a new file in Photoshop. This is my canvas, and I want to make sure the map fits on a single sheet of 8.5 by 11 paper. This map won't need a grid, so I use the paint bucket tool, left column, to paint the background white. It's like I'm starting with a fresh sheet of blank paper. And the screenshot is essentially a white rectangle in the same dimensions as an eight and a half by 11 sheet of paper. It's like a blank image. Step two, use layers. I like to build my maps in layers. Each new map element I create gets its own layer. That way, if I need to make changes to one layer of the map, I can do so without affecting the other layers. All right, this is common sense Photoshop 101 stuff, but the screenshot shows him it looks like in the layers menu, creating a new layer. Step three, grab my pencil. My pencil is embedded in the toolbar on the left side of my screen. Most of the map will be created using this simple hand drawing tool. And the screenshot shows him hovering over the pencil tool on the left. Step four, draw, erase, draw, erase. Using my mouse and pencil tool, I draw a rough outline of the island on the background layer. I've set the pencil width to five pixels, which has a nice line weight. Drawing with the mouse is hard. Sometimes the lines don't look exactly right. So I use the eraser tool in the left toolbar to erase the sections that offend me, and then redraw those sections until I'm happy. And the drawing shows a rough sketch of an island, essentially. Step 5. Build the volcano. The volcano on the island will be represented by a series of concentric contour lines, each one representing an increase in elevation of 100 feet. These rings are drawn with the pencil. It's tedious work that will pay off later. 
and the screenshot shows the northern part of the island with concentric rings around it, like topography lines to indicate the volcano height. Step six, add cliffs. Using my pencil and eraser tools, I carefully extend the 100 foot cliffs around the rest of the island. Except for a short section to the south, I make sure there are no gaps in the line work so that I don't run into problems when it comes time to paint sections of the map with color. So the screenshot shows more concentric rings around the volcano, and it looks like a cliff line around the edge of the island that has a beach on the western edge. So it looks like you'd come ashore on a beach and there'd be a sheer cliff in front of you, kind of is what it looks like. Step 7. Add hills. This island is inhabited by hill giants, so I figure it needs hills. I draw several low hills at the base of the volcano, as well as a rocky rise at the southern tip of the island where the petrified dragon is perched. And the screenshot shows like four small hills south of the volcano, as well as one hill at the very southern tip of the island that looks like a special location that really any adventuring party would definitely check out. And he's going to put the petrified dragon there, which I think is actually really cool. Step eight, add a dock. Using the eraser, I erase a small bit of the island outline. Then I use my pencil to draw a stone dock protruding from the island. If it doesn't look right the first time, I erase it and try again. Up to this point, everything has been drawn on one layer. And this step doesn't have a screenshot. Step 9. Create a new layer. I'm ready to start adding details to my map. I create a new layer and call it Hill Giant Homestead. And the screenshot is him creating a new layer called Hill Giant Homestead. Step 10. Draw a house. My layers appear in the toolbar along the right side of the screen. Using my pencil and mouse, I draw a hill giant homestead anywhere on the map. Because it's on a separate layer, nothing I do will affect the rest of the map. I draw the house bigger than it will appear in the final so that I can get the detail I want. It looks like something the Flintstones might build, but which seems appropriate for a hill giant dwelling. And the screenshot shows a small picture of a house drawn out in the ocean, and it, I guess it would be kind of bigger than you would use on the map. So what he's doing is he's drawing it in higher detail, then he's going to shrink that layer down and place it where it would be. Yep, and here we go. Step 11, shrink the house. To shrink the hill giant house so that it is appropriate size, I use edit, transform, scale as shown. Then there's a screenshot of the edit, transform, scale menu in Photoshop. Step 12, place the house. Using my mouse, I click and drag the resized house so that it's where I want it. I can do this because the house is on its own layer, separate from the rest of the map. And then there's a screenshot of the house shrunken down and placed somewhere on the southern side of the island. Step 13. Duplicate the house. Because I'm lazy, I'm not going to draw different hill giant houses. I'm going to copy and paste the same one over and over using layer duplicate layer. Each time I duplicate the hill giant homestead layer, I get a new house that I can click and drag wherever I want using my mouse. And there's a screenshot of the layer menu open with duplicate layer selected in Photoshop. Step 14. Make a hill giant cemetery. The hill giants bury their dead under rocky hilltop cairns. The cairns are created exactly the same way as the hill giant homesteads. I create a new layer, build one cairn using my pencil, shrink it down to the appropriate size, duplicate the layer over and over, and click and drag each new cairn into place. On a whim, I use the same trick to create farm fields around the hill giant homesteads. I create a new layer, draw five rows of wavy lines using my pencil, set to one pixel width, and then duplicate the layer multiple times. Once the lines are placed, I use my eraser to cut the corners. And this screenshot shows the island with lots of little hill giant houses. There's like wheat fields outside the houses. And then on the four hilltops, there's cairns, which would be like the hill giant cemeteries. So yeah, he basically added little details to the island. Step 15, make waves and caves. Believe it or not, my map is 75% complete. Time to add some details, specifically a row of caves along the northern cliffs and some water lines around the entire island. I want to make these changes to the background layer, so I make sure that's the layer I'm working on. See the right toolbar. The waves and caves are made with my pencil set at 3 pixels. The waves in particular look better if the line work is a bit thinner than the outline of the island. So in this screenshot, it shows the little waves, which are like little squiggly lines around the coast, but are thinner than the topographical lines. And then it shows the little darkened caves on the northern edge of the island. Step 16, just add water. Before I apply color, I save my map. That way, if I screw something up, I have an unpainted version to revert to. My color palette is in the top right corner of my screen. I'm gonna limit myself to the colors offered here. I want to make sure I'm applying color to the correct layer. In this case, the background layer. I select the shade of blue I want and use the paint bucket tool in the left toolbar to fill in the desired area. If there are any breaks in the outline of my island, the paint will flow into areas I don't want, so I'm careful to check my line work. If I use the paint bucket and the color doesn't fill the desired area, I can undo it. 
Edit, Undo, or Command-Z on my Mac, and try again. And the screenshot shows that he used the bucket tool to dump a light blue in the water section of the map. So there's now a blue ocean around the island. Step 17, paint by numbers. The paint bucket is a poor man's coloring tool, but it serves my needs. I select different shades of yellow, orange, and brown to represent the various elevations and then use the paint bucket to apply those colors to specific layers. For instance, the blue water in the caldera is on a different layer than the blue water surrounding the island. And the screenshot shows that he colored the island based upon the altitude of each topographical layer, with higher elevation being darker and lower elevation being lighter. Step 18, add pretty little trees. I forgot the trees. No problem, I create a new layer, then draw and paint the trees whenever I want on the map. All right, and the screenshot shows him drawing trees out in the ocean, kind of like how he did the house. I assume he's drawing them bigger so he can have detail, then he's going to shrink them down and put them on the land where he wants them. Step 19, transform the trees. I not only want to shrink and relocate the trees, but also flip them horizontally so that they fit in the specific area of the island I have in mind. Once again, I use Edit, Transform. The horizontal flip tool is an easy way to make your map elements feel less cookie cutter. In the accompanying diagram, the two smaller stands of trees are basically two identical layers one of which has been horizontally flipped. And the screenshot shows the Edit, Transform, Horizontal Flip menu highlighted and selected on Photoshop CS4. Step 20, build the beach. I use the pencil tool, set at one pixel width, to make stipple marks along the western shore, giving it a sandy appearance. Then I create a new layer, use my pencil and paint bucket to draw one palm tree, duplicate that layer six times, and then use my mouse to move the seven palm trees where I want them. And this step has no screenshot. Step 21, add elevation tags. We're almost finished. Time to add text to the maps. To make the elevation clear to my players, I add text tags to the various elevation lines, plus 100 feet, plus 200 feet, and so on. To make the text more visible, I apply a glow around the text using layer, layer style, outer glow. Not all of the text on the map needs this treatment, just the text would be hard to read otherwise. Step 22, save and enjoy. I use a traditional D&D statue icon to represent Zarendroth, the petrified gold dragon. This symbol is part of the Zaf Dingbats font family, as is the star-like symbol I use for the compass rose. Like all of the tags, they're added to the map as separate layers using the type tool, T, in the left toolbar. With the tags in place, the map is complete. I save the file. At some point, remind me to show you the tools I use to build maps for the ships that crop up in my nautical-themed campaign. Until the next encounter. And here we have at the end a screenshot of the finished product. It's a pretty good looking island map. Island of Zarendroth. I don't know what to say about this, guys. I didn't know I'd be jumping into a CS4 Photoshop tutorial, but here we have it. I think there may be better tools these days to use online. Of course, I had to record this article for completeness of the series. So it is what it is. If you made it this far, man, hit the like button because uh, I think a lot of people probably noped down to this video a while back. But anyway, I think my biggest takeaway from this is I'm going to check out that Zaf Ding bat font because there might be some cool symbols on there but other than that it's a cool little tutorial to build a simple map in photoshop or gimp or any image editing program but like i say now with the explosion and popularity of dungeons and dragons there's so many websites and resources you can use these days compared to back then that i don't know how applicable this would really be but hey it's here i read the article hope you enjoyed it let's see what the next one is real quick the next one's called constellation of madness I don't know what that means. It sounds. <laughs> I thought this map one was gonna be way more fun than than it, than what it turned out to be. But hey, it is what it is. See ya.